Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Battery 2030 Plus Excellent Seminar. Uh, my name is Digita Travesinger. I am from Paul Scherer Institute. And I am also in two of the Battery 2030 Plus projects. Uh, one of them is called Giving Bot, and the second one is the Open Charge. And the Open Charge project is actually related to the topic of today's excellent seminar. It's dedicated to the interface understanding and new methods, de methods development for interface understanding. Therefore, I'm doubly happy today to moderate the first of the two uh, Battery 2030 Excellence Seminars, where uh, first one uh, today is uh, given by Professor Christina Etre, where she gives an overview on the understanding of the battery interfaces. And uh, the second one will be given on 28th of November, where the speaker will be Professor Jennifer Roop, and she will talk about solid state battery interface. And of course, every one of us know Professor Christina Estrem. However, I would like to tell a couple of words anyway. And uh, Professor Christine Ekstrom, she's a professor of inorganic chemistry at Uppsala University in Sweden. And she's our dear coordinator of this large-scale European research initiative, Battery 2030+. She is also the heading the Angstrom Advanced Battery Center at Uppsala University. And she has more than 350 scientific papers. And her age index is actually not 70, but 78, <laughs> which is very <laughs> impressive. <laughs> so with that, Christina, I would really like to ask you uh, to give this talk. And I'm looking really forward to see into the background and the uh, insight in, of the interfaces, because you were the one who actually introduced the battery interfaces also to me. So the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you so much, Agita. And thank you everyone for coming this afternoon and listening. And unfortunately, I have to ask you to de-share your screen. Excellent, thank you so much. So I, oh, sorry, I will, oh, I'm jumping too fast. I'm too slow. Now, I will talk about uh, uh, perspectives on interfaces in batteries. And when I planned this, I, I thought I would give you a rather broad uh, on both the anode and the cathode and different battery chemistries etc. But I ended up this, uh, going deeper and deeper into the SCI on the negative electrode thinking what more do we really, what is it that we really need to do and really understand? And then I looked at what are the advances today in our understanding and what did we understand when I started with interfaces at the end of the 1990s. And you can see just on this uh, cartoon here to the right, that uh, the interfaces in batteries are extremely important. They have to do with uh, the stability of the battery, that you actually can use graphite, for instance, as a negative electrode for lithium ion battery. It has to do with solvent composition. It has to do with also what's happening on the uh, positive electrode, that you can have metal ion dissolution, poisoning the negative electrode SVI. You can have HF formed. You can get uh, the uh, Lewis acid PF5, who is very reactive and react almost instantaneously with ring opening, destroying the EC. So there are so many things in this. So 
I will mainly focus actually on the SCI and I will mainly focus on the experimental side of it and going through it. And uh, there are a lot of interesting modeling um, techniques used for trying to describe this now. I think the fastest development is probably right now on the modeling side. So we will try to have an excellent seminar uh, on that topic also primarily on interfaces because we have good modelers in Europe that we can show. So, you know, there are at least 15 different interfaces in the battery material. I was provided this figure by Jean-Marie Tarascon and uh, uh, Dominique Lachère from, uh, from France. And, you know, you have particle-particle interaction, binder-particle interaction, you have electrolyte uh, electrode interactions, you have interactions with the positive electrode, the negative electrode, the current collectors, et cetera, et cetera. So if you count it like that, uh, it's many. And batteries do degrade, uh, but how fast depends more on how they are used and how much they are used. So this how, I think that has been known for the automotive industry for a while, the driving pattern of a person driving an electric vehicle is actually influencing a lot the um, lifetime of a battery, which is the same as for our body, of course. Mm -hmm. If we treat it well, it, it will last longer. I was provided this um, citation from Wolfgang Pauli, who was a physicist from Austria. He died in 1958. And already before that, he realized that God made, made the bulk. The surface was invented by the devil. And sometimes I've been thinking like that myself when we have tried to understand what is really happening and with the techniques we have available and how difficult it is to really probe nanometers of layers that is, for instance, the electrolyte uh, electrode interface, which is sort of the important SCI, or the SPI as it might uh, uh, semi-permeable interface or cathode electrolyte interface. It has several names, this interface on the cathode. And you can imagine also with the lithium-ion battery, we have a highly, highly reductive uh, end of the battery and highly oxidative end of the battery, how that will put a strain on the chemicals you use. And it's more or less fantastic that we can use four, maybe even up to four and a half, five volt batteries in the future, um, because we can manage to handle the interfaces of the batteries. So I found this paper also very interesting. It was published last year, um, that it also contained not only um, an, uh, an attempt to describe how is ionic transport formation uh, uh, mechanism through an SEI on a carbon electrode, but that you can also estimate a cost uh, for this SEI formation that we need it to protect from co-intercalation of solvent, but, but it's also uh, something you have to do in industry that you actually have to have a formation of the SCI pre-formation uh, before you send out your your batteries for purchase uh, to a customer. And it's it's quite substantial uh, part of the total cost of the battery that you have to do this pre-work. So what I will try to under explain is sort of a little bit, what does the SCI uh, consist of? and what morphology has it, what is the formation mechanism of the SEI, and, the, and discuss a little bit about the ionic conductivity mechanism through the SEI. I will also slightly touch upon the crosstalk between the electrodes. When I started to work at the end of the 1990s uh, with interfaces, it was very few in the world who did it. It was names like Emanuel Pellet and Auerbach, that might be names you've heard. Because now it's really a top, hot topic. And if you look, just make a search on Google on what kind of, of work there are on, on, the, on SEI, on the negative electrode, you will find many different cartoons trying to describe the composition and the morphology of this. So have also we. So if we go back to the history of this and try to see 
what have we learned through the history to come to where we are today and the difficulties we have to describe this and that has sort of followed us along the line. There were two kind of models pre presented early. The first one that is the well-known mosaic type of structure by Pellet already in 1979. It was a lithium metal, it could be a carbon. Uh, only a few la years later, Auerbach came with a, a different kinds of structure where you had lithium and more of layered structure close to the electrode and then a, a more porous interface uh, on the top. And I can al already say that we, in my group, uh, looked at this during the 1990s and we could say that, well, it's probably a combination of these two, <laughs> two models that you have actually a mosaic type of, of pattern and it's more of inorganic compounds at the close to the electron and more of a mushy polymer type of layer, just like explained here also in the, in, in the pellet model. Uh, so, and the reason why we started was that we had battery production, lithium ion battery production in Europe. We had a company called Danionics that actually sold battery and, uh, commercially before it was um, sort of sucked up by another big company and decided that they they do a lot of their production in Asia instead. This was around uh, 2000. And what the problem they had was really that during 1995, it was possible to start to use graphite in commercial batteries because Pearson had, had described a compound called ethylene carbonate could make if an SEI layer formation of a layer on, on the, the graphite so that you prevented co-intercalation. And this is what we still have today. But then I had the problem that, well, there are many sorts you can have with this EC, with this graphite. Now, you know all that know a little bit about batteries that LIPF6 is the, often the commercial sort, but at that time, LIBF4, was much more stable on the shelf in the laboratory than LIPF6, who degrades much quicker. LIBF4 was really good in half cells versus cathodes, but it turned out LIPF6 was much better uh, for the anodes. So in, in fact, that we use LIPF6 today is a compromise, but it's also good because of the current collector aluminum on the positive electron. So what we did was a model study with a graphite electrode, looking at the uh, room temperature cycling. And we could see that with LIPF6, we got a smooth, nice layer of lithium fluoride uh, and, and these uh, mushy organic compounds. While for the LIBF4, which you actually can see even on the SEM micrographs. Already then, we knew how important it was to dry everything and transfer things from the glove box to an instrument in a, in a proper safe way. But you can see with LIBF4, you got much bigger uh, crystals of, of, uh, of lithium fluoride on the surface. If you go up and cycle at 60 degrees, you increase uh, the polymeric phase, but also the lithium fluoride crystals, but they are uniform and fine. While they were big and lumpy and almost crushed the polymeric phase, uh, for the LIBF6. And to make a short, a uh, long story short, this doesn't cycle at 60 degrees. You can't make it cycle. You will just uh, have a spontaneous de 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 intercalation of the lithium from the graphite. But at 60 degrees, this works fine. You can cycle it at higher temperature. So that helped solve that problem. But then we realized that we needed to understand this much more and with more techniques. So we have continued to try to look at what are we really seeing on this graphite electrode. And this is a way of trying to describe that it can be in the mushy outer organic layer, quite heterogeneous, but we have a much more homogeneous layer of inorganic compound, lithium carbonates, etc., uh, on the lithium, uh, graphite surface. But you can in some, uh, uh, but you also see lithium fluoride uh, crystals within the um, organic layer further out from the surface. And five year, a number of years later with new techniques where you really could do a much safer depth profile instead of 
trying to sputter an edge with an XPS, you can use the photon energy and go deeper and deeper and try to see something. We could see much better that we had an outer organic layer, we had lithium fluoride all through the SCI, and it was quite different than both in thickness in than in, and in composition compared to lithium. A, cat, a cathode like uh, LFP, for instance. But the, the layer, the SCEI layer for lithium ion phosphate, very similar as the outermost layer of the on the graphite. So um, this is a little bit of the history. And here, just to, to show you, uh, to verify what I said, with LIPF6 here, we could make uh, the storage experiments and cycle up to 80 degrees centigrade at that time without a problem, but here at 60, it died Ooh, down And when we used LIPF before. And we do think that this matters, that you have destroyed the, the nice balance between the polymeric layer and have two large lithium fluoride crystals than uh, you have in the case of LIPF6. And we, the methods that came that we said that we could actually use for really penetrate the depth was a number of um, synchrotron beam lines coming up uh, during 2002, well, up to now is const constantly developing. So we could at, at the max four synchrotron in, in Sweden, uh, really look at the outermost surface with the photon energy, low photon energies. We could go to an in-house XPS and see, uh, get a certain depth. And then the first ever in Europe, um, HAXPES instrument was in Bessie in Berlin. Now you can find it in Diamond and Max. You can find it in many places in Europe. Um, and then we can make depth program and you can do it through rough surfaces. Oh, sorry, oof. That was not good. Ding, 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 ding. So in this way, you can actually go really deeper and deeper. And here is an example of, of a graphite and uh, uh, the SCI. And you can see for the lithium inserted carbon, which is the what we have calibrated versus that you have then carbonaceous species. Uh, that are different at different depths. And the deeper you go, the more of the, the graphite and the lithiated graphite you will find. Um, so this is the more uh, clear view of what I said. So I think this is very interesting. What can we do now that we couldn't before? Now we are coming closer and closer to what we call, what we want to do which is really to look at the more realistic system when it's happening. And, uh, and uh, with cryo-electron microscopy, we could see uh, that uh, by cooling down that the lithium fluoride actually and lithium carbonate, they are spread out in, in the SCI, similar to what we said early. We said it already 2001, but, and we said it 2013. But now we have much better resolution and techniques where we can, can actually go in and penetrate this in de more detail. Um, and this, uh, all studies of these, uh, um, I mean, this is of some kind of standard electrolytes uh, that we have used to look at this, but there are fantastic review papers showing all the kinds of different compositions of, uh, solvents and salts and what kind of negative electrode you have been having and the kind of methods that have been used for studying this. And there are many techniques that are complementary and they show a little bit different things. But you see, it's really centered around uh, FTIR, XPS, NMR mainly. When it comes to questions about the positive electrode, you can see the XRD starts to play a role. And for some carbon materials, Raman is also uh, important, but then you have to have SIRS because the resolution of Raman is often not enough. And it's that these layers, they are around, uh, yeah, 
20 to 100 to maybe a few hundred nanometers. So they are not that very thick to study and on the cathode that's even, even um, uh, thinner. So um, these are just some examples of different salts with, uh, with uh, solvent. But if you go one step further, there are lots and lots of additives that one tries to put in to make the SCI better and more functioning. And we'll discuss that a little bit later. Later. So what do we really know uh, about the SCI? We know that it's generated on the negative electrode and it happens during the first charging cycles in a full cell. We know that it's passivating for the anode surface. If it's graphite, it's a little bit different if it's silicon. So this means that it inhibits further electrolytic decomposition, which means that you can get these stable batteries with long calendar life required for, for the electric vehicles, for instance. I think some really nice work that I could recommend you to look more into is done by uh, Professor Brett Lucht from Rhode Island University in US. He's really an organic chemist looking at the uh, the products, what do you really get of the, all these compounds that you can find in the SCI? I mean, it's a multitude of compounds. Uh, people have talked about PO type of compounds, uh, carbonates, alkyl carbonates, oxalates, um, etc. Plus that there are gases evolving also when this SCI layer is formed. But he suggests that the main the reduction products is lithium ethylene dicarbonate and ethylene, which is then this gas. And it's actually the instability of this LEDC that gen generates this, this large mixture compounds, uh, which complicates the composition of the SCI and makes it so intriguing that so many studies and um, come up with all kinds of reaction mechanisms, there are whole, whole big volumes in, in books. Since uh, Bearson has spoke about the battery handbook from 1998 up to now, uh, and that's interesting. Uh, there are also a lot of additives, and there will be a difference in SEI structure, the morphology, etc., with the presence of electrolyte additives. What I find intriguing is that, of course, some elect uh, additives are better than others, but it's always a question of just adding one two percent of something that makes a difference. And uh, I think that's interesting. So speaking of solvent and additives, the most common then uh, are, uh, are the um, uh, rings with EC. And EC seen as the magic one for really form the SCI. But you know that EC is solid in, in room temperature. So you often uh, mix it with DMC or DEC or EMC. I think these three are the most common. I learned already in the 1990s to skip DMC because that you couldn't allow it. It was not allowed to be used in a in a factory uh, because it's so volatile. Um, the vapor pressure is so high, high. So that's why you in my publications find DEC as the main component. But the most important um, uh, additives, one or two percent, is the vinylene carbonate and is the, this one, FEC. So they are extremely important. There is also a very good solvent called propylene carbonate, which is much better because it's liquid in room temperature and you can go down quite far, uh, far in temperature before it freezes. But that is not working. This little extra methyl ion here doesn't give you a function SAI. And that's also uh, been, uh, part of the discussion for a long time. It seems like it is sort of, instead it's, it's gassing and doing a lot on the graphite surface, but can be good for other systems. And speaking about gas evolution studies, because this is important, then we're, uh, this is a very uh, new um, result from uh, Robin Lundström, who is a PhD student in Uppsala, presented at the ECS conference a few weeks ago looking at specifically EC and see, can we see more than what Brett Luke told about this main com compound? Well, he says by doing DEMS, differential 
electrochemical mass spectroscopy, he can see that you have two reaction pathways that occur on a model carbon electrode. You can have the easy ring opening, which is in a, in, initiated by hydroxide and alk alkoxide above 1.5 volt versus lithium. And that gives you some carbon dioxide evolution. But he also found an easy reduction pathway, which is occurs at potentials below 0.9 versus uh, lithium. Early. And that is what we typically call the, the, uh, the instability of the electrothermodynamic instability of the electrolyte that is below 0 0.8, 0 0.9 volt versus lithium. But then, and then they have the ethylene evolution. Uh, and this is sort of well known, and I've already mentioned it. So, uh, but uh, it's interesting that uh, both reaction pathway can contribute to information of the SCI and that they compete with each other. So if EC ring opening is favored, it can suppress EC reduction. The addition of EC ring opening initiates. So if you have too much water, in your, your uh, electrolyte, then you have a lot of carbon dioxide and it reduces the ethylene production. So that is extremely important. And you see it in this graph here that uh, with the, the baseline you have, and then you put in more and more water, you, 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 uh, you um, go to more and more carbon dioxide. Formation. And that can explain some of my early attempts in the 1990s. Well, were my first batteries, they became balloons rather than real batteries. And we learned the hard way uh, during that period to really, really dry everything very, very clearly. So it's nice to uh, 30 years later get an explanation on why you made balloons in your batteries. So looking a little bit more uh, on this kind of um, of uh, additives, the VC is extremely common, and that was used by Dunionics already in the 1990s when they produced their first graphite electrodes, which happened then around 95, 96, 99. Before that, the first commercial batteries were rather made on soft carbon materials. So VC is important. What's happening with VC is that we have seen that also there you have some kind of a polymerization because you have this double bond here that can help you to give a nice layer on the surface, and which also gives you some kind of more dynamic and flexible uh, SEI. Uh, FEC seems to also react on the surface and, and actually give you the VC uh, and, and the typical signals from the VC. And again, we use of Huxpress, I've shown this already to you. We started earlier to look at silicon and looking at the different layers you find in silicon, we could actually identify the SEI component, but also this silicon fluor oxide fluoride compound, and that we had this lithium silicate in this silicon oxide native uh, compound. So that was a very nice results of Bertrand Philip, uh, who is now working at Volvo Cars in, in Sweden. And uh, we could also see that early that some salts that didn't give HF uh, uh, with water, like LIFSI, was really, really good also for, for uh, uh, stabilizing the cycling. You have to remember that this is uh, 10 years now. And, uh, and uh, I think more importantly was that when we really understood that we should use FEC, we could be the first to really show this VC polymerization on the silicon surface. It was only a few months later, <laughs> Shirley Meng's group come up uh, with the same um, uh, solution, uh, su suggestion in a paper. So we were very happy that it was confirmed that way. And you can see what this FEC does. It's really prevented the cracking you have in the silicon material when you are charging and discharging because you have this volume expansion with lithium reacting with silicon. It's an, a substantial volume expansion and contraction when you uh, reduce, when you extract the lithium ions. Yeah, 
and you can see uh, with different depths, different species and, and learn about when is the fluorinated silicon oxide coming and when do you have the the uh, um, the um, pure silicate. Uh, so that was interesting. And then uh, continuing this work, Lindgren, one could see that adding both FEC and VC into the cycling, it went really well. Uh, but then we added a little bit of extra salt that turned out to quench the water you might have in your system. And then the result became even better that you can see here, the cycling numbers up to 100 cycles, rather stable. All these were done on, on small particles, silicon particles that were in the 10 uh, nanometer range, because that seems also to be very important for the uh, functioning of silicon. It was also reduced, you didn't use the full possibility of, of lithium alloying with silicon, but instead uh, set at a certain uh, current so that you 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 uh, didn't go from the to the detrimental last uh, crystalline phase of silicon. So this we thought was really great. We have contributed to understanding how to make lithium uh, silicon much better. But then Sigita came, and this is a uh, quite new, very interesting in result. I must say where uh, she looked at tin oxide and silicon with a new method called X-ray photo emission electron microscopy, so, which has a very high lateral resolution, more and better than uh, we by just using XPS traditionally like, like we did. And uh, here you can see that it, you have like two mechanisms. First, that you have an FEC decomposition products that aggregate into spherical particles. Um, and that this growth depends on the cell medium and follows the law of crystal growth theory. And then, as a second part, you form a continuous carbonate-rich film. So the question is, is it really the carbonaceous film that is important for the good function uh, with FEC? Or is it actually that you have this layer formed first? This is an interesting discussion, and we are going to have a Q&A after this presentation. Maybe I will be allowed to ask Sigita this question. I hope so. So if you look at um, this description on a long-term cycling of silicon and the evolution of the SEI, there are many descriptions. One is that you have you charge your particle, you get your lithiated silicon, you know it's grow is big. You told you do this you deinsert de your lithium and uh, the particle shrinks, and you get a distorted SCI that breaks, and then you put in more lithium again and it builds, uh, and it builds uh, etc. And in many cycles, you have more like a very thick SCI layer on it. Another description that I took from a paper by, by uh, Emmanuel Peller from 2008-17, I like this much better. Then you have the SEI formed, and then during discharge, you get you still have your SEI, but you get a lot of mushy layers on uh, outside that. And after, after many cycles, you still have your inner, inner layer of the SEI, which is sort of a hard shell almost, but you have a much more porous secondary SEI. This fits much better with the data we had produced you in 2013, 14, where we cycled silica electron for thousand cycles. It was more main, at the end, it's mainly graphite or the carbon additive you're cycling, but anyway. Uh, and we could see that this inner layer never got really thicker but that you had a, a different thing with a more porous carbon layer. So um, with new methods and new descriptions, it's it's a lot of microscopy techniques, et cetera, combining RAM and FTIR. I think this, uh, this is a, a sort of a, an interesting picture. And in total, you must say that the SEI is growing. And of course, you break many of the particles, especially if you don't have 
so small particles, but you have larger particles, you break them up and you form more of the uh, fresh SCI, et cetera, also in this. So this is something which is this. Now I would like to move more uh, towards the discussion. How is the SCI formed? And this is a good question because if you go back in literature, we tried with a lot of FAM, FA, AFM studies to look at the growth, especially on HOPG crystals uh, that have their kinks and arrows, et cetera. But it was not so easy to see how you formed uh, this layer, uh, but it was easy to heat it up and see that you got like blisters and salt crystals left on the surface. So this idea combined with XPS where you said, well, it looks like you have a layer uh, closest to the uh, electrode where you have the inorganic compound and then you have the mushy outside. That was sort of confirmed an indirect way. But we were also worried at this time that the way of doing the experiments with AFM, you were more like using the tip of the AFM to sort of push around the mushy uh, organic layer, which led to a very heterogeneous uh, SEI layer and um, but uh, we can say that the, the typical inorganic compounds uh, lif or uh, depending what you have in, in your electrolyte lic lithium uh, oxide etc as well as lithium carbonate are there and also uh, semi-carbonates and polymers the more careful we have become with the experiment the less lithium fluoride and less lithium carbonate we find on the surface because they are the most stable compounds. And we might have uh, side reactions due to the experiments we do that helps for more lithium fluoride and more lithium carbonate um, because of the experimental conditions and it really is. However, um, something else I would like to show is that it's, it's, it's uh, when it's formed, that it seems like looking at just different carbons, that we do have a different compositions of the salt reduction products, the carbonates, and the polymer type. Here is you have the basal plane of an HOPG, which actually is the same as here to the left, and there you have mainly the polymer form, very little of the of the salt reduction products. Well, do you go to the cross section? That, that is where the lithium ions really can penetrate in between the graphene layers. You have much more of the salt uh, uh, reduction products. If you have a soft, uh, soft carbon, it's also different. Not as much, well, a lot of course salt reduction products, but not as much. While if you have a hard carbon, you have uh, more. Uh, also in different uh, distribution. So I became very happy when we find this paper uh, coming out this year that actually in a much more realistic way, even if it's in situ, uh, moving towards operando and the model system could actually start to show how this SCI is formed. By using, in this case, a glass of carbon, okay, it's not the same thing as graphite, but at least we learn a lot from it. You have the solvated molecules, you have the salt, uh, and you see it's the normal LIPF6, ECMC, and you have the counter electrode, you have a reference electrode, and you have a membrane. This is a very nice work from Switzerland. Uh, you can actually see that you have first a reduction of the carbonate solvents here close to the surface, and you get an island type of SCI layer, uh, a reduction, and uh, and then you have the growth of this SCI layer, and then you get a very dispersed SCI layer with the lithium fluoride forming early, like particles out and through it, the lithium carbonate, the lithium oxide, um, depending on how much you have of that, of course, depends on how much water you can get, get rid of. It's It looks... Uh, to me, like being a little bit too much lithium oxygen here, but that's fine. It depends on, because this is an extremely difficult experiment. But the general principle is really there. And then you get the 
with time and densification of this layer. And you can see that you have the lithium fluoride crystals all through this uh, mossy organic layer. Or well, it says mo mostly in organic layer. But you see that you have, of course, organic layer into the uh, surface of the uh, electrode as well. This is very neat. It's um, it's it's uh, one of the few where you really have seen this grow in in a very nice way. But it also shows that the work we did a long time ago was not that bad. But we didn't understand it really. We couldn't explain it well because we were limited in in uh, both understanding but also in the methods. But sort of the main things were there, which is nice to see. <laughs> and it also shows us this SCI, you can say that you have undesi under des desirable reactions with the risk for co-intercalation of the solvent between graphite layers. The desired reaction is that you have a desolvation of your lithium ions when the lithium is going in between the layers. You can have soluble products, partial uh, uh, reduction. This is very much true for sodium batteries. You can form the insoluble products like lithium carbonate, lithium chloride, and get precipitation. Salt ions, solvents, polymerization, etc. It's from 1998, but here we can see it. It was not bad, Pellet and Golodnitsky, what you did and present in 1998. Uh, so, if you then summarize a little bit the properties of uh, the SCI, we can see that it, it, it needs to be an electronic resistor. It needs to have a cation transfer number, which is close to one, to eliminate concentration polarization. You need high conductivity re to reduce overpotential. Preferably have a uniform morphology and composition for, for homogeneous current distribution. This is extremely important for lithium metal uh, because it's a non-homogeneous current distribution you get on the, on cycling a lithium metal is that gives you the lithium filaments uh, that you can see and the dead lithium. More about that uh, from Jenny Farouk later. And you need to have a good adhesion to the anode. You need to have a mechanical strength and flexibility. Um, and and so then we come back to these carbons and, and uh, look at how, how, how good are these SCIs in practice. And if you look at the first one, which it's a base plane, we don't get in an lithium. So that is out of the discussion, but it shows you that uh, you, when you have the lithium reacting with the bulk of the material and you get the dissolvation, you get much more of the salt uh, products. Uh, and you get also this really nice cycling here curve where the lithium insertion starts at point two. When you have soft carbon, which was the choice between 1990 and 95 for the commercial batteries, there you have only half a lithium per six carbons instead of one. Sorry, I made a mistake here instead of one for uh, for six carbons in graphite, you actually get less of the uh, of the uh, salt, but you also start at a much higher potential to, to insert the lithium ions into the soft carbon. And in the hard carbon, you get a lot more of a irreversible reaction products, which seems to also influence the balance between the, uh, the polymeric and, and uh, the salt balance. So this is also something important to think about. And that comes to the, my next point, that you also have transport of ions through the SCI. And uh, this is what I think is the most unclear picture we have on the SCI. How is really the lithium ion being transported in or out of the SCI? Is it a lot of these compounds you could found, find are they necessary? Do they contribute to this lithium ion conduction? Or is it just a few that does? And these uh, that really does, uh, are they important? 
in many of the classical pictures, you say you have your D, you have your solvated iron with the solvent molecules. This that I made in this nice figure from Krauss and Pattenberg and Rowling. I made it myself. That's why it looks so ugly. Um, is this desolvated when you start to meet the SCI here? Or do you need big pores to get it in and really react here? Or is it sort of true? We have also discussed, do you still have sort of solvent and, and salt in, in, in sort of the porous layer here? So that also belongs to the SCI or not? I think these things are very unclear. And uh, what this group showed also in a very recent publication, which I find extremely interesting is that you, the, you can talk about the carbonate transport, transport, which is rather slow in this SCI. While if you look at redox molecules, like iron uh, um, cyanide, for instance, you, you have redox flow that can react really quickly and go back and forth. So what we need to know more about is the lithium dissolvation step at the SCI electrolyte interface. We need to understand better the lithium diffusion through the SCI layer, but also the electron transfer step at the SCI electrode interface or the electrode active layer current collector interface. You can see some examples here. So I said that your, the properties is that you don't, uh, you can't have uh, electrons really uh, going through the electrolyte, it needs to be insulating. But it seems like you have a certain electron tunneling building the layer to a certain thickness when you don't, you can't have this tunneling any longer. But is that really true? And I think there you have to look at um, uh, this. And I also discussed uh, and, and be polar transport of molecules as the carbonates they have, can, can they play a role here? Especially from the inner SCI to the outer then, outer more mushy ones. This is very interesting to discuss. I don't have the answers to this, but I think we need to really go into this uh, uh, important. And this figure shows the different uh, lithium ion transport mechanism in the inner SCI, these two. And this uh, to the right here, illustrate the different electron and solvent molecule transport mechanisms in the inner SCI. So please youngsters that listen to this, you, uh, here you have a bright future to solve this or the projects within battery 2030 plus that are now to really focus on the interfaces for the future. I've talked a lot about the SEI as such on graphite, a little bit on silicon, a little bit tin was even a little bit there on, on another slide. But you also have this that I started with, that you have seen to have some cross talk between the negative and positive electron. And one thing that we have seen is difficult for both what I would say some solid electrolytes, especially the oxide types, and for cathodes is that you have always a little bit of lithium carbonate on the surface. And that might be that you have a crosstalk between the negative and positive electron. Also, not only the metal ions that you can have. So um, by, by having again, a, a small percent of 2% of a additive, you can actually, uh, quench this and remove this uh, lithium carbonate in reactions. And you can also have it as an uh, HF scavenger. And then you can actually reduce this crosstalk that you, the two electrons seem to poison each other. And this is another approach that we have to think of. What does that really mean for the a negative electrode uh, SCI? We can see that we get uh, this uh, the phosphorus and to some extent the silicon into the SCI as well here, so it has a, a, a role here. And it has some distinct uh, PO SI based compounds. So uh, um, we need for better uh, characterization mechanisms. This is taken from a paper that Batch 2030 Plus published in its. Uh, in Advanced Energy Materials, uh, a review paper on interfaces. Uh, we had made a special issue 
uh, two years ago, so you can find it there. And you see there are many techniques today, and I think the flora of techniques for studying interfaces are important and, and will is growing. I can see a new feature coming in some soon here in the really the low, lower sort of uh, range here, and that's free electron lasers uh, coming into this play as well. But you know, microscopy, microspectroscopy, spectroscopy, diffraction, mass spectroscopy, all and operando, is it to chemical sensitivity, phase sensitivity, all these are important. And you can group them uh, so that XOD has uh, sort of, can talk about phase sensitivity and you can do it operando, while, um, while XPS is really good for chemical sensitivity, but it's difficult and you, you start to do operando here as well, etc. So this is how, and, and that you have certain lateral depth uh, that is meaningful to use these techniques. And here you see that for interface, it is tricky with the XRD because the interfaces are much thinner. Um, and, and Raman has also its limitations. So what we need to consider now when doing experiments, uh, that is that we need to make sense and sample holders designed for an accurate electrochemical response. That is what I think was a starting point for this um, microscopy paper where I showed the growth, uh, the nucleation and growth of the SCI, that paper that came recently. Um, that's a step forward. And of course, you can, that work on batteries can say, well, but that was still a model system, still not similar to what a real uh, cell is. Yeah, that's right, but it's a step in the right direction. I think so. So these are just three examples of cell designs for operando XPS studies. Uh, you can dip your electrode into the electrolyte and, and then try to, to measure uh, with what's come up with the capillary forces and what interface you get there. Or you can have solid uh, interactions or and membranes, etc., and try to do these. Uh, there are many. The, here we will see a, a big, uh, um, I think, a development because we go more and more for ambient pressure XPS, more and more realistic. But the XPS requires very high pressures traditionally. But we have also the effect of the primary beam. I said at one occasion that I'm a bit worried that we overestimate the amount of lithium chloride and lithium carbonate that we find in this and lithium oxide in layers because the primary beam, like an XPS beam, for instance, can actually can actually uh, lead to more uh, formation of lithium fluoride because it's so stable. So, um, but we can see, we see definitely now that these spatial and temporal resolutions of an excitation beam and secondary emission detectors need to be improved, but they are also improved. So we can adjust the spectral response to the dynamic time scale or ionic diffusion at the interfaces. So um, XPS, you know, is a photon in, photon out, uh, electron out uh, uh, method where you can actually not only look at the surface, the outermost surface, but also at buried interfaces, which is the interface between the active material and the SCI. And I think this is also something that come recently. And I want to show you this example because I think this, work by Julia Maybach now at uh, Chalmers and Maria Halin in Uppsala has been really important, at least for making me understand that we now with XPS techniques can look at the double layer between the SCI and the bulk. And uh, I said that it's important that the SCI has a good adhesion to the um, electrode, because uh, which it seems to have uh, in many cases. But it's also so that you do see that it depends on how you look at your spectra and how you calibrate it. Calibrate it on the bulk, which is the graphite, which you see here in the uh, in the uh, this peak. You you for a fully litiated, you get a different distance to what we can call the SAI components that might be less conducting, so they shift away. And when we remove the lithium, we actually get a shorter distance here. And that can be explained by how the charge between the 
the uh, SEI and the bulk is sort of uh, lining up and how much charge we have left when we have removed the lithium ions. And this has also led to a way of quantifying quantify how much lithium you might have in your surface here, which shows that with the even low cycling, you get a little bit of buildup of lithium in this interface here. Yeah. And then you can go at different depths and look at this bulk and see how, how this shifts. And this is important how you use your, your results and how you can explain them. Uh, and I think we are a bit old fashioned in, in still in what I read in papers on how we should handle data. This is just another example of the same thing, how, how big this shifts can be and uh, that it changes the cycling. And this is a, again another idea of how you can understand the spectra that if you have a highly conducting part like the graphite, it, it, the binding energy of your, your signals are essentially not affected. While if you have a not as, as conducting layer like in the SCI, you can have chemical shifts that uh, uh, are due to the alloying or, or to the lithium intercalation, depending on the material you have. Uh, and if you have really poor, poorly conducting materials, the binding energy shifts with electropotentials. So you get really a, a differential charging distribution of surface potentials that you can see when you do your experiment. But there are so many nice things coming up early. There were some uh, uh, operandi studies of lithium air battery cells. Solid uh, gas systems are not that difficult to uh, study. More difficult is to look at solid solid interfaces. A very nice work uh, from Kevin Wood uh, from 2018. I think there are some really nice work also from from uh, PSI in this respect. And and uh, I I must say this that Anas Spina from CA in Grenoble has done on ionic liquid solid interfaces is, is a very beautiful experiment. It also can tell you something about the nucleation uh, and formation of the SCI layer. So we are coming to a state where we learn more and more. So what to do more and what to understand? Well, I primarily think that we really need to look at the how is ion, ions and electrons really transported through this SCI layer? Uh, more tricky than perhaps the uh, cathode electrolyte interface, because there you have other reactions with a little bit of, of corrosion reactions and, and so on going on, because you are a highly oxidized in state. Um, but we still need to understand what are the important species of the SCI. And that comes to the other thinking, can we pre-make really good SCI so that we don't have to spend so much money when making a, a commercial battery just on the formation cycles? And of course, uh, we can see that the tools developed today are giving you much nicer and better results than we had 30 years ago um, and uh, with a be much better precision. I haven't talked about modeling, but there is a huge effort now going on in modeling and have a close slope between experiments and modeling is necessary. And we will uh, we will have another lecture um, in this excellence uh, series uh, talking about that, but we have one already, which I can recommend. And that is Christine Persson from Berkeley. You find it on the website. Uh, it's uh, uploaded on YouTube and texted so you can access it very easily. So please do that. So with this, I would like to thank you a lot and thank all the funding agencies and especially thank Battery 2030 Plus and the Big Map project, on, on, uh, which also deals with a lot with about interfaces in different ways. So thank you. I hope something was understandable. <laughs>